In this video, I'm going to give a, an explanation and a demonstration as to how the wiggler is used in the milling machine. You would have seen me use it in my previous videos, normally talking about finding the edge or finding the center of a workpiece. The device itself is really, really simple, um, but it is very, very effective and can give some very good results. So it consists of a number of parts, the main body, which is here, and then a number of attachments. There's only three that I ever use. There are others available, but we'll be concentrating on these in this video. So we have a ball locator, we have a dislocator, and we have a needle. As you can see, each of the attachments has a ball, a large ball at one end. This ball fits into the socket on the main body, like so. And then the three devices can be used in different ways to be able to accurately position the spindle of the milling machine above the workpiece. As I now need to make another set of clevises, this time for the left hand of the bike for the gear change linkages, we'll use one of those as an example as to how the wiggler is used. First, I need to cut this bar to length. Okay, so the book piece has now been cut to length. Just to uh, let you know, what I've done is I've cut it big enough to be able to machine two clevises from it back to back or front to front, depending on your terminology. So what I now need to do is I now need to find the center of this end of the workpiece, which is what I will then use to be able to set up this bit of stock in the forge or chuck in the lathe to be able to turn the rounded stub we see here on the end of the clevis. What I'll do before we actually put it in the milling machine though is I will use the surface table, which is below this piece of cloth, and the vernier height gauge to actually scribe a couple of lines across that face very accurately to show where the center of the workpiece will be. To scribe across the workpiece, I've now got the workpiece on the surface table uh, alongside a vernier height gauge. The vernier height gauge is a, another very good piece of kit. It allows me to very accurately mark off lines from the surface of this table or surface plate to give it its proper name. This is very very flat um, and the vernier gauge will move around on it. Just, and as we can see we've got quite a sharp tip on the end there which is what we use to scribe. I just now zoom in to actually show how that works. Running down through the centre of the vernier height gauge, we have the calibrated strip. The left hand side is calibrated imperial, so inches and thousandths thereof, and the right hand side is metric in millimetres. How anyone works in imperial is a little bit beyond me. Um, messing around with all those silly fractions just doesn't work. However, it is often the case, as we are today, um, where I have to work with imperial stock or English stock. So the bar that I'm dealing with is half inch square, which I then just convert across immediately to metric. So half inch is 12.7 mil. So what I've got is a piece of bar which is square at 12.7 millimeters. So to find the center of that bar, I need to set the height gauge such that this tip is 6.35 millimeters above the surface of the table. That's half of 12.7. And we do this using the vernier gauge on the right hand side. So you will see that I actually use a magnifying glass to get even more accuracy. So this goes down in terms of calibration to 0 0.02 of a millimetre. So I'm going to set this at 6.36 millimetres. Technically we're 0 0.01 millimetres away, but we can live with that level of accuracy. So 6.36 millimetres is now set on the vernier gauge. 
So what that now means is the tip of the scribing point here is exactly 6.36 millimeters off the top of the surface table. So I can now scribe that across the end of the workpiece. As it's a square bar, I can just move the bar 90 degrees and scribe again. And there you can see the intersection of those two lines should be pretty damn close to the centre of that piece of work. I could now of course just centre punch it and drill into that, but the act of centre punching brings in a degree of inaccuracy because it relies on me getting the centre punch exactly on the cross the intersection of those two lines. What we'll now do is we'll move over to the milling machine and I will clamp the workpiece onto the table of the milling machine so it is standing vertically. Before I go on to demonstrating the wiggler in action, it's going to be worth taking a couple of minutes to just explain the setup with the milling machine. This particular device, which I think is a Warco Major mill drill, is as basic as they come. This is the right of the right at the bottom end of the market for milling machines. It's referred to as a mill drill because it can be used as either, as in fact can all milling machines. And as you can see at the moment, there is a chuck in the quill with the drill bit in the chuck. The main components of the milling machine are the table, which I'll come to back to in a second, the head, the spindle, which is where the drill chuck is, which runs down through the head and is connected via a series of bolts to the motor at the back. The important aspect of the milling machine is the table and the fact that this table can be moved with respect to the spindle. There are adjustments on the table in terms of it moving in and out and also in terms of it moving left and right. The third adjustment that's normally used in operation is the quill, which is very much like a pillar drill, can be moved up and down to move the tool into the work. On my machine, I have connected a DRO, or digital readout. That's the device you can see there on the right, with the LED displays of numbers. And this is connected to the table and to the quill by a number of sensors that allow the position of the table to be displayed on the DRO screen. And if you look as I move the table in and out, the middle row of numbers changes. That's the Y axis. This table in, this is table out. Likewise, if I move the table left and right, you will see the top row of numbers changing. That's the X axis. And we've already seen the Z axis in operation with the spindle going up and down or the quill going up and down. These DROs are now quite affordable. Going back 20 years, they, they were probably a little bit too expensive, but most people that have setups like mine in their home workshops will have a DRO on the milling machine. And in fact, to use the mill without a DRO, it, it's quite complicated and messy. It, it makes life so much simpler having the DRO. There is a lot of functionality also within the DRO. There's a whole load of programmable functions, which is why it's got so many keys to the right of the displays. I very rarely, in fact, never use any of those functions. To me, it's just about knowing the position of the table and therefore the workpiece below the quill. Hopefully that's made some sense and will give a bit of context or a bit of background as to why and how the wiggler is used. The workpiece has now been firmly bolted to the table in the milling machine. I'll zoom in and just have a quick run through on the setup. What we have here is an angle plate. This has been clamped to the table. You can't see that from the camera side, but it's got two nuts and bolts on the rear, clamping it firmly to the table. This is being positioned so that it is at right angles to the X axis and directly on the Y axis. So it's sitting at 90 degrees across the table. On the right hand side, clamped to the angle plate is a small square. This is here to help me fit the workpiece 
so that it stands vertically. So as you can see, the square is off the surf off the face of the table, uh, and the workpiece is now pushed up against the square, therefore ensuring it's sitting properly vertical. And then what we have here is just the clamping device that's holding the workpiece very firmly in place. First off, we'll use the needle attachment, which we saw at the beginning of this video. I'll install it into the chuck, and then we'll have a demonstration of, of how it's actually used. So just removing the drill bit, which is only a loose. Install the main body. I'm not sure if I said earlier, but the drill chuck that we have installed in the vise is not a particularly accurate piece of kit. This will be as, as, as good as you get in your electric drill at home, which means that anything that is fitted into it and clamped into the jaws of the chuck is not necessarily going to be completely central or concentric with the spindle. But for the purposes of what I'm doing with this centre drilling, we're going to be more than close enough. If I wanted to be much more accurate, I would not use the chuck. I would actually take the chuck out and I'd use collets um, and fit the attachment or fit the body directly into a collet. But this is going to be fine for what we're trying to achieve today. So the main body goes in and then the attachment slips into the body, into the socket and is tightened up. Let me just come out a little bit on the zoom. There we go. Simple as that, that's installed. Okay, let's start up the machine and see how we get on. I should point out that the speed of the mill here is very important. If the speed is too high, the attachment will very quickly throw itself across the workshop. Um, so I've got the mill running now around about 200, 240 RPM, which is a good speed. I've just found that by experience, anything above that, and it starts to get very unstable. We can see at the moment that the attachment is running quite true. If I was to touch it slightly, it very quickly goes off true and does as its name implies, it wiggles. So with the needle attachment, what I need to do is I need to get it steady as it was a second ago. So very carefully, and not always very easily, use my finger to bring it in. And as those wiggles set out, there we are, it's a good place to be. I'm just going to zoom the camera in now. The camera is pretty much square now, looking directly onto this side. And you should be able to see the two scribe marks, one going front to back and the other one going left to right. For the sake of this demo, we are just going to look at the scribe mark that is running away from us, so front to back. With the needle wiggler settled and not moving around, not oscillating, we can be very confident that the very tip of that is absolutely in line with the spindle of the milling machine. So what we'll now do is we'll move the table and we may just drop the wiggler down a little bit lower to bring it a bit closer, closer to the workpiece. But we'll move the table until the point of the wiggler is directly above that line. It won't work for the camera, but I often use a magnifying glass. So at the moment, the tip is slightly to the right. So I would say we're absolutely spot on there. In terms of the tip of the wiggler is directly above the line that is going away from us front to back. So that tells me now that the spindle of the milling machine running through the center is directly above the center of the workpiece between the left and the right faces. We could now move around and do the same with getting the tip of the wiggler directly above the line that runs left to right from this view and therefore putting the wiggler absolutely on centre for that workpiece. 
but we're not going to do that. We're going to swap out the attachment to the ball locator, and I'll walk, walk through how that is used. It's worth noting at this point, actually before we move on, that now that I've got the quill directly above the center of the workpiece from left to right, that I would reset the x-axis on the DRO, which I'll do now. Okay, let's swap it out for the ball locator. As we can see, the ball locator is now fitted to the body of the wiggler. And what we do with this is we'll use this now to find the edges of the piece of work. So again, we need to start the machine, not too fast, same speed as previously. And as before, we can see the wiggler wiggling. I'm just gonna reset the DRO to get it away from the zero we just put on it a minute ago. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm gonna visually align the wiggler to the line that's going from left to right or right to left on the, on the workpiece, the scribe line. This, this is just to get it close to center. In fact, we're pretty damn close from using the uh, needle a minute ago. Okay, so now what I need to do is drop the ball locator down, or drop the quill of the machine down, so the ball beside the workpiece. Again, let me zoom in. And as before, we can see that the wiggler is, is wigging away like a good one. So what we are looking for now is to finding this left-hand edge of the workpiece. So what I'll do is I'll move the table from right to left, so bringing the workpiece up against the wiggler. And what we'll see is that the wiggler will slowly stop oscillating as it's getting closer and closer uh, or making contact with the workpiece. So we'll get there first. So moving the table across from right to left. There we go, that's almost stopped now. So the next action is the really important one. What I'll do is I'll keep moving the table very, very slowly from right to left to the point at which the wiggler breaks away and that'll be quite obvious when it happens. That will occur because the workpiece is pushing the wiggler off center. So at the moment it's nicely in balance, but as soon as that workpiece pushes it too far, it will actually go out of balance and break away, as you'll see. Okay, let's move across nice and slow. There we go. So the point at which it's broken away is the point at which we will first reset the x-axis on the DRO. With the x-axis now set to zero, what I need to do is move the table by half of the diameter, or therefore the radius, of the ball on the end of the attachment. The diameter of the ball that we're using, the ball locator, is 6.36 millimeters. So I'll now move the table 3.18 millimeters to the left. There we are. So what I have now done is centered the quill directly above this edge, this left-hand edge of the workpiece. And I'll reset the x-axis again on the DRO. So what we now have is when the x-axis is reading zero on the DRO, it means that the center of the spindle is directly above the left edge of that workpiece. If I now want to move so that the spindle is halfway across the workpiece, I just have to move the table 6.35 millimeters, because that's half of the half inch block, 6.35 millimeters to the left, and therefore the spindle will be directly above the center of the workpiece.
Okay. So that's good. So now we know that in terms of left and right, the quill is directly above the workpiece. If we repeat the same exercise front to back, we can do also then locate the center from front to back. However, we're going to do it a slightly different way, um, which is just another way of using the wiggler. So we're going to keep the table where it is on the x-axis, so we'll keep it in the center, left to right. But I'm going to bring the table forward and then put the wiggler back down so it's not spinning around wildly. And now I'm going to move the table back in towards the milling machine. So again, we will see the wiggler settle down and stop oscillating. What we'll do now is we'll continue as we did previously on the x-axis. We'll very slowly continue to move the table in towards the wiggler until the wiggler breaks away. There we go. I will now reset the y-axis on the DRO. I'm now going to move the table all the way back in and again bring the wiggler down and this time we're going to find this time we're going to find the front face of the workpiece again absolutely the same way very slowly move the table forwards to the point at which the wiggler breaks away There we go. Okay, so according to the DRO, we have 18.97 millimeters on the, on the y-axis from where we reset it with the wiggler from the back. If we divide that by two, it gives me 9.485 millimeters. We're not gonna go down to the third decimal place on this, we'll just go with the 9.48 millimeters. So if I now move the table back towards us by 9.48, the center of the quill will be directly above the center of the workpiece, front to back. There we go. So right now, the center of the quill and the spindle of the milling machine is directly above the center of the workpiece, which is what I was trying to achieve. That's brilliant. So I've now found the centre and I can centre drill accordingly. The centre drill is a, is a very specific tool. It's not a normal drill. It's not the sort of thing you would use to knock a hole through a, a piece of wood or metal. It's got a very specific profile. They do come in different sizes, but the profile in terms of the angle of the cutting heads is very specific um, and absolutely essential when it comes to using centres in the lathe which is what we're going to be doing ultimately as i'm going to be drilling a center hole down into here and then relying on those shoulders and the angle of those shoulders to locate what is called a dead center in the lathe for which i can then center the workpiece in the four jaw chuck I've now changed the gearing on the milling machine, so it's going to run a lot faster. This is going to run at its full speed, which is around about two and a half thousand RPM. That's because the diameter of the tip of the center drill is very small uh, and the cutting speed for stainless is actually quite high. Stainless is horrible to cut normally. This, this grade is not too bad, um, but we'll see how well it goes in. What I'll do as an experiment is before I dive all the way in with the drill, I'm going to touch it. Uh, and if we've done everything right, the, where it touches the workpiece should be the intersection of those two lines we previously scribed. Probably the best view there. I think we've done pretty damn good. Pretty damn good. So the scribe lines were good, um, and the using the wiggler to find the centre has also proven very good. Brilliant. Very pleased with that. I'll now drill it properly. 
it occurred to me when I was watching back over the video that I recorded so far that one of the things I hadn't done and should have done was actually checked the dimensions of the stock material. Although it's a half inch square bar, it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be exactly half an inch uh, wide in both directions. I should have done this at the beginning and all of my calculations should have been based around the actual thickness of the square bar rather than uh, theoretical. But we'll do it retrospectively, we'll have a look and see just how close to 12.7 millimeters the square bar actually is. So left to right, the digital display on this doesn't work, so we'll go by the old analog method of reading it on the gauge, reading it on the spindle. So left to right, we actually have a thickness of 12.645, I'd say, yeah, 12.645 millimetres. So we are 0 0.055 millimetres under spec. That's negligible error when you consider what I'm doing. And then if we go front to back, very similar it's 12.65 just over smidgen over so again 0 0.05 millimeters under size not a problem at all with what we're doing incidentally or interestingly the when i use the ball locator i use two methods one was to find this left face then center the spindle quill directly above the left hand edge and then move across by 6.35 millimeters. That method of course will only work to get it exactly in the center if the stock was 12.7 millimeters. So there's likely to be a very slight error 0 0.02.0025 of a millimeter left to right. The other method we used of finding the rear face and then finding the front face and divided it by two would of course compensate for any errors in the thickness of the material. So front to back, we are going to be absolutely spot on. Left to right, very slightly out. That error would also occur for when we did the marking out on the surface table with the scribe, because I assumed the workpiece was exactly 12.7 millimeters square um, and set the height gauge accordingly. So we'll see a little, little, little bit of error on those scribe lines. If I was making some really fancy, highly accurately specified component, that may be a problem. But for knocking together some clevises for a, a linkage for my gear change on a motor guzzy, which is somewhat agricultural anyway, is not going to be a problem. Another point to capture before I finish this video is that at the beginning of the video, we talked about three attachments, the needle and the ball, which we both used but also the disc locator, which we haven't used. So the disc locator works in exactly the same way as the ball, in that we would push the disc or the workpiece up against the disc, being careful it's a disc and not touching the spindle, of course. Um, and the point at which it breaks away is where we would take our measurements from. From memory, I think this disc is, well, we can check. I think it's 0 0.01 of an inch, which is going to be something like 0 0.0 two five of a millimeter sorry two and a half millimeters or thereabouts so what have we got it's actually 2.9 millimeters so yeah we'd offset it by 1.45 rather than 3.186 we did earlier